Hey everyone, today we're discussing how we're roasting our new Kenyan coffee from the Kambanji process station in Kiwaniaga. Welcome, we're back and this time we're gonna push a roasting video. It's gonna be in two different parts and what we're gonna talk about in the first video here is how we're roasting our new fresh crop Kenyan coffee from the Kambanyi factory in Kiwaniaga. So as I said, we're gonna push two different videos here. The first one is gonna be more detailed roast aspects. And the second one is gonna be a lot more QC. When we say QC, we mean both quality control of the green coffee as well as the roasted coffee. So that will come in a later video. Now, the coffee itself, and for you guys that have been following us for a while, know that Kenya in April has been a challenge this season. And we decided to actually move in and buy a cooperative lot, which we discussed previously that we weren't, weren't interested in. The reason for that is because the logistical climate today has changed, right? So COVID-19 comes in and it's massively disrupting the logistic patterns of most green coffees. Meaning that we know we have a lot of green coffee coming in, but we still don't know exactly when. So we needed a coffee to fill out our menu of coffees and we're really happy to bring in a Kenyan coffee that we had the very first season here at April, which is Kambanyi. Now, Kambanyi comes from the Kirinjaga region, which is a really cool region featuring a lot of the more classic Kenyan coffees. We're talking a lot of berry notes, a lot of floral notes, which is something that we really like here at April. Now we've seen a progression of Kenyan coffee over the last years that in my perspective hasn't been very positive, as in Kenyan coffee tasted better 10 years ago than what it does today. A big part of that is growing cooperatives where the sorting gets more complicated. Some cooperatives, including Kamani, has gone from 100, 200, 300 different farmers to today up at 900 different farmers. And it goes without saying that it's more difficult to find those very tasty lots. However, we managed to do that, which we're really excited. For sake of transparency, this coffee is sourced through Nordic, and Nordic has purchased this coffee through Dormans that has purchased this coffee from the Kambanyi factory. As you can tell, Kenyan coffee gets a tiny bit complicated, but this is how the line of basically purchasing has been moving on. And again, we've been featuring this coffee before and we're really excited to have it again. Now, first of all, just some general ideas about Kenyan coffee. One of the things that we really like is the fact that it comes vacuum packed. It suits us perfectly as we have a standard batch size of 15 kilo roasting on the 15 kilo lowering behind us, which means we can basically just open a bag and pop it in. Does vacuum pack improve taste quality over time? Yes, definitely it does. Do we have science to back that up? Not necessarily, but we do have several years of tasting, cupping, roasting coffees that are both vacuum packed and not. And here at April, we're moving towards having more of our coffees vacuum packed this season than ever before, as we believe that that actually increases the quality of the final cup, which is what we're all about. Now, another little side note, and we pitched this before, I'm gonna pitch it again. It's very important as a roaster to work with a destoner setup. Now, it goes without saying that almost any coffee, regardless of quality, regardless of price per pound, can still end up with stones in them, right? Even Kamanya, which is one of the best sorted coffee coming out of one of the best factories in one of the best countries in terms of processing. We still roasted it today and we found a stone in it, right? So that's why we think it's very important that you actually work with a distoner. Now, let's take a closer look at the actual curve. So we've actually done a video in the past discussing how we roasted a Kenyan coffee from basically first arriving to later in the year kind of growing a bit older, right? And by that also changing the taste aspects of the coffee. Now, what we've done initially here, since this coffee has quite a lot of intensity, quite a lot of vibrancy and a slightly high acidity, 
what we've done is we're stretching out the profile. So we're actually roasting a bit longer than what we're used to here at April. Touching crack at 10 minutes and basically moving all the way up to just about 11 minutes in total roast time. This is going to allow us to have a much juicier cup of coffee with a great vibrancy because we have so much acidity in the coffee initially. We're focusing on a roast where we get transparency and we get sweetness and we find that longer roast brings that in our coffees. So in general, we roast shorter times when we have coffees we need to get more vibrancy in. Another thing we've done here and we pitched it before is that we're looking at Top rate of rice, we're looking at crack rate of rice, we're looking at end rate of rice. And you're gonna see on our profile that we're working with a 30 second setting on crops or when we're roasting. But what's important here is that we wanna stretch out the roast. We're basically locking in time after crack to be just around a minute. For this specific coffee, we actually pushed it a bit longer, meaning one minute and eight seconds. This is again to create a bit more clarity in the coffee. And what we're also doing is that we're actually taking down the end temperature to be a bit lower than what we're used to. So the combination of slightly longer after first crack, about eight seconds than our standard profiles, together with the slightly lower end temp creates a really good harmony and balance in the coffee. Now, in order to achieve, with a 15 kilo batch size, a profile that is just above 11 minutes, that has a specific crater, a crack crater rise, this coffee being just above five, then we need to start to initially soak the coffee. And there is a lot of theories and ideas about what does soaking actually do. And when we roast, what we do is that we look at what is our total roast time, what are we looking for, what is the time after first crack, and which crack crater rise do we want to have moving into crack. And then we decide the composition of burner settings based on that, right? So it's more of a total timing in terms of total roast time and when does this crack happen than anything else. Now, in my experience, what I can say is that starting to initial soak in the setup that we have gives us a slightly softer coffee with a slightly better taste composition. So in terms of tactility, it fits together a bit better. And when you have a coffee that is as acidic and juicy as this Camagne is, you can afford actually doing it. Whereas for example, if we work with the Ecuadorian coffee or Costa Rican coffee, we would most likely start with a much higher initial burner setting to get a bit more vibrancy out of the coffee. So that's currently how we're working with it. And the answer, as always, is in the cup. And I think it's something that you guys should remember as well. And part of why we do this video is that if you want to answer to all of your questions, buy the coffee. That's always what it comes down to. So we're all for measurements. We're going to show a lot of those in part two of this video. But in the end of the day, it's about the taste quality of the coffee. So when discussing roasting, when learning about roasting, we need to actually taste the coffees that we are discussing. As in, discussing a curve you haven't tasted the coffee from doesn't make any sense and it's basically a waste of your time. So back to the profile. Now we're starting with an initial soaking and about 110 degrees Celsius, we're doing an increase of burner settings. This goes from 60% up to 100%. 100% is then the burner setting we have for the remaining duration of the roast. And we can do this because in general Kenyan coffees, especially this Kenyan coffee this season, has a tendency to plummet quite effectively after first crack. Meaning that if I take down my burner on this system, I'm going to lose too much momentum. So I can actually carry out 100% all the way. Keep in mind that having 100% from the beginning of the roast versus having 100% started later in the roast, there's also a massive difference. And on a lowering, it's really easy for us to control because we see things at inlet temperature, stack temperatures, what helps us basically monitor what those changes does. Now, again, last point, we're going up to crack, crack on this machine quite continuously. For us, it's around 200 degrees Celsius, sometimes 199.5, but it's within that range almost continuously based on the fact that we have the same batch size as well. Now after crack, we let the coffee go to one minute, eight seconds, which again is slightly longer than what we would do on a filter profile. But because we decided to take the temperature down, we need to actually stretch it out to avoid to have any grassy notes in the coffees. And the result is a really juicy, vibrant coffee, which is super exciting to taste. Now, 
for these videos, for them to really make sense, what you should be doing is you should actually go to the website, you should get yourself a bag of Cavagna coffee, um, you should brew it for yourself using one of our brew guides, you should watch the videos, you should wait for next week's videos, which is part two, and we're gonna be able to have a really interesting communication and conversation, um, giving you a better insight in what we do and how we actually roast here at April. But for now, that was all that we had today for you. Again, remember, this was part one. We have a part two coming for you next week, so you get more insights in how we roast our Kenyan coffee from Kamandi here at April. Thank you for watching.